so different. Good morning, good morning, good morning, my We Are Not So Different family. Thank you for choosing to tune into yet another episode. This morning's guest, we have Miss Tara. Now, before I go butchering your last name, Galliano. Galliano, perfect. Awesome sauce, <laughs> Miss Tara Galliano with us here this morning. Good morning, Tara. How are you? I'm great, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, like I said before, like you bring up or you 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 master in some of the the questions and topics that people that I know have not I don't know tuned into or like had the courage to speak about or so I, I I'm grateful for you willing to share like your knowledge and your wisdom this morning. So I appreciate you. Yeah. So my we are not so different babies. Y'all know the drill. Find your favorite spot on the couch, get your favorite drink, whether it's Kool-Aid or Cavassier, get comfortable, tune into this conversation. Let me give you guys a little background about Miss Tara. She, Miss uh, Tara Galliano is an author that she's worked with women for over two decades to get their sexy back. Hey, she knows there is pleasure in the body beyond our wildest dreams and every woman can access it. In her book, Rediscovering My Body, Tara teaches women how to show up for pleasure in their lives. Yes. She rediscovered her own body after leaving her 25 year marriage. Girl, 25. Realizing, <laughs> realizing that she had given so much of herself away, she knew that she needed to come back to the body's inherent wisdom. Through reconnecting with her body, Tara was able to understand what was right and pleasurable for her, how best to proceed with this wisdom, and most importantly, how to teach these lessons to other women who are clamoring for the same truth so they too could transform their lives and reclaim their sensuality. Now Tara has embodied this plan with embodied this path and is moving forward to share with women everywhere. She's been featured on New York Times, New York Post, Washington Post, just to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, Tara Galliano. Before you enter the applause. <laughs> Man, that is a mouthful. Um, but it also makes me glad anytime I can share with my listeners um, the background about a person's journey and just to know, you know, okay, Miss Miss Tara, she got receipts. She not just coming at y'all with just stuff hearsay, but she's mm -hmm. been through some things. Had to have been through some things. Twenty five year marriage. We gonna tap into that in just a little bit, in just a little bit. <laughs> but my interview started out the same. I always give out the same two questions for every guest. Miss Tara, are you ready? I'm ready. Question number one: If you had the undivided attention of an audience of your choosing, who would said audience be and what would you tell them? Ah, that's interesting. Cause I've had a fantasy recently that I was at the Oscars and I was receiving an award and I was just expressing such deep and profound gratitude. And yeah, not so much for the audience, although I appreciate them being there, but really okay. like, like all of my mentors and my teachers and the people that have created the lineage that I am a part of and feeling like, you know, I'm just a link in the chain. I'm standing on the shoulders of my ancestors and thank you for putting me here on this earth at this time, at this place. And just, yeah, really feel the honor of that. Wow. Okay. She having fan she said fantasies about Oscar. I don't know exactly the categories and, and things that you can do to get an Oscar, but maybe it was a prestigious award, something just as, you know, honorable as an Oscar. I'm just saying, you know, you never know. <laughs> you never okay. know. Brush up that, that accepted speech, girlfriend. <laughs> Your platform may be uh getting ready to enlarge. I'm gonna leave that where it's at. I love okay. it. Number two, if you had the opportunity to speak to a younger version of yourself, like say four or five year old Tara, what do you think she needs? 
Mm-hmm. Four or five, that's young. I'm that young. is a little bitty. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can adjust the age, you know, if you yeah. need to. <laughs> yeah, I like four or five. I'm like, play more. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't eat the Play-Doh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but play more. I feel like that sounds good. That sounds like a good message to begin this conversation with. (laughs) All right. All right. So after reading your prestigious bio with all the the good chunks and pieces, two decades, it's a long time. It's a long time of experience, of qualifications, all this good. Exactly what is your title? Can you like... Yeah. Yeah. I can truncate it. Yes. (laughs) So I'm trained as a clinician and my title often is sex therapist. Okay. All Mm -hmm. right. That works. So I I I would I want to ask what transpired in your life where you felt like, okay, this is the way I want to turn? Or was there one day an epiphany? Or was it like you're in college and um, arts, liberal arts isn't working out and this is what I do? Like what led you down this path? Ah, yeah. So I always, and I had said this before to somebody else that I had dreamed about being an educator. Mm -hmm. And so I studied English. I, I mean, I'm a writer. I like to write. And so words were really important to me. And I would dream and literally dream that I was teaching people a new vocabulary. And then when I graduated from school, I was an educator and I taught English and I taught Beowulf and Macbeth and it was all very fun until it wasn't because then all of this content, these literature pieces were getting in the way of me knowing my students. And I thought they were much more fascinating than Hamlet, and I Mm -hmm. wanted to know who they were. And they were pregnant teens, or they were grandmas wanting to get their diplomas. They were students who needed to work and not go to school during the day. So they really were a really select audience. And I loved them, and I really loved getting to know them. So I thought, what is the process, or what is the thing that I can do that takes out this content and replaces it with their content? And then it was therapy, right? It's like, how do you help people become more them? And so then I studied, I went back to graduate school, studied psychology, trained to be a clinician. And so that was the pathway forward. And what I see now, particularly because I am trained as a sex therapist, is that the dream of teaching people words and vocabulary is really what I do because I help people find language around their desire. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that you're a dreamer. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to segue into that later, but I, I like that you're a dreamer. So, so you're training as a therapist, you become a clinician. What was like the point where, okay, I want to go from learning more about, like you said, their story as opposed to literary arts or whatever. Then how do you segue into the whole sex therapist? Like, yeah. Yeah. Take me down that road. I mean, I am intrigued. (laughs) I'm nosy, of course, but I am intrigued because there's like, there's so much and I'm good and grown, right? I'm 43. I'm good and grown, but it's like, I feel like I'm still learning so much about my body and I've had it for a good, (laughs) good long time. Right. So when I, when I come across people who have trained, but then even more specifically in this topic, it's hush, hush, talk about it behind closed doors, taboo, but then you're like a whole therapist, like you're a learned in this area. (laughs) I'm intrigued. So like, how did you, yeah. I mean, it's a great question, Andrea, because like when I was four or five, right, just referencing that girl who was here at the beginning, myself, Mm -hmm. I wasn't dreaming to be a sex therapist. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. But it's somewhere, somewhere along the way, it came into my path. And when I graduated from school, uh, from graduate school, I knew that I wanted to start a private practice. So I started a private practice and I started helping people. And everyone that I was helping wanted to talk about sex, sexual preferences, sexual fantasies, their relationships. And the reality was I had zero classes 
on human sexuality in my graduate studies. So even though I knew a little bit from my personal experience, I didn't know enough to help my, my clients. So then I had to go back and I studied to become a sexologist. And then I got certified as a sexologist. And then I got certified as a sex therapist, it was a very stringent course of study. And then I started working more exclusively in the field of sex and sexuality. And so it's been a progression. And, and for me, it was a response to the vulnerability and the intimacy that my clients were sharing with me. And I felt so honored that they would talk with me so freely about their sex, their sex lives. And I thought, okay, I just got to get up to speed. I love that. So you saw a need and you was like, let me, let me fulfill that. Let me, let me feel. I love that. I love your heart. Okay. Let me just put that out there. I love that. And you're right because it's like, like I was saying earlier, sex has the tendency, just the thought of it can raise anxiety levels across the board. Right. So on so many different levels, on so many different cultural, ethnicity, so many different realms, right? So the first thing I think of, I'm a church girl. I was raised in the church. Now I'm sure you've had some church girls or guys come across (laughs) here. So it's like, that's a whole different beast that you have to deal with because from the very like young, it's beat into us, sex is bad. Don't do it. Sex is bad. So then (laughs) we go from the, okay, well me, and this is me, like, don't tell me not to do something because then that's what I'm going to want to do, right? <laughs> so, I think there's a lot of out there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. So then you do it and then you're stuck dealing with the shame or guilt or whatever else comes along with it. Furthermore, what about those ones that do wait? God bless y'all. God bless y'all. Ministry. Mm-hmm. The ones that do wait until marriage and you beat into yourself, sex is bad. Don't do it. We'll stay and abstain. Then you get into marriage and you don't know what to do with this human. And I'm a woman. So I'll say, you don't know what to do with this man because your whole life you've been, you didn't beat it into yourself that sex is bad. Now that's a whole myriad of, of other issues that come along with intimacy, sex, blah, 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 blah. And I feel like I'm talking a lot. Don't let me do that. <laughs> what I meant to say all that, what kind of things have you come across as you travel down this road this journey of can I say sexual liberty I feel like is that yeah a term say it. okay <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's like what I can only imagine the story is like what you come across and how the things that you have to break people free from or give them the liberty to express themselves because of how taboo the topic, uh, the topic of sex is, and not just in the church, but like, yeah. especially in the church. Yes. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. So, I mean, just yes, 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 yes. I mean, uh, really, <laughs> to everything that you said, I, I see that and we do that. And for me, the reframe is that sex is, natural right it is a natural part of our being that's how we all got here we got here from the sex act yes it's a miraculous experience and that it is our birthright to experience pleasure Mm -hmm. i truly believe that and that we don't often get that we don't get that in the education we don't get that in the culture we get the overlay of shame and don't do that yeah. and abstinence and maybe you get some sex education but it's all about um, birth control and prophylactics and it's not about sexual pleasure and it's not about how to please yourself and speak your desires and it's not about pleasing your partner and hearing their desire desires or receiving it so there's this whole other part of education that for me is really important to be providing for people. And a lot of it has to do with conversations like this. Like mm-hmm. this is the starting point for a good sex education. Like, okay, because what turns you on, right? And what is true for you? And neither is right nor wrong. It is just true for you. And I think when we can claim that, then we can really begin to release the shame or at least acknowledge the shame and let it go a little bit more because when the shame reigns then 
we don't have the opportunity to learn or explore or give ourselves permission to have pleasure. Mm. Mm. We need it. We need that. That's what we're here yes. for. Yes. <laughs> Because otherwise you're just walking around literally just pent up with this, like, you know, and it's like, uh. so, okay, so you're working with someone and you encounter, like you just said, the, the, the shame or the guilt or whatever, you're working to help them acknowledge it, potentially begin to release it. And how do you, I don't want to, I feel like I'm about to say something that's maybe like bad for your line of work, but <laughs> you, I don't know. And if I am, you know, just correct me. Like I trust you. How do you, okay. Once you have um, a, assisted someone in obtaining a certain level of sexual freedom, then how do you, and this is the bad part where I was like, I don't want to say tame. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you like, you know, like how do you how do you go about guiding them to a place where it's not just about you know being promiscuous but it's about like respecting your body and respecting like how do you how do you guide that how do you keep someone from and I don't even I don't I, don't, I feel like even my terminology is wrong I'm thinking like how do you keep someone from letting their freak flag fl fly but maybe you need to let your freak flag fly I don't know let your freak flag fly <laughs> so I guess yeah so how do you how do you how do you guide that how do you yeah how do you present that to someone I love it. Yes. So for me, because I am trained as a therapist, my truest desire is to, yes, let their freak flag fly. Yes, let it fly, baby. Let it fly. Let it fly. <laughs> and to begin with this sense of self-respect, right? It's like, it begins here because when we know what's true for us, then we can begin to say no. And then when we begin to say no, our yeses can be that much more powerful. And what I find, at least when we get to a certain level of maturity, is that we need to be able to begin to understand what resonates is true for us. I mean, I think as a young person, oftentimes we're collecting experiences because we're curious about a whole bunch of different things and that's fine. And it needs to be explored, I believe, with self-respect and the ability to keep oneself safe. Okay, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a key word. Yes. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, because we don't feel safe, then we're actually not going to be experiencing pleasure because what happens is then our nervous system is overloaded and we get stuck in the sympathetic nervous system, which is a fight or flight response. And then we're not going to experience pleasure because we're wondering, am I safe? Am I safe? Mm. Um, and that's not necessarily the wiring that we want to trigger. We want to trigger, I would say, more pleasure. How do I relax into more pleasure? And so it's about actually, I would say relaxing and allowing, which is somewhat antithetical to how we view sex is I got to get it. I got to do it. And, and it's, you know, very linear progression. And the opposite is just about like, how do you experience more pleasure by just allowing? And I would say it's by feeling safe and by knowing that you really are respecting yourself. So you will keep yourself safe really important okay okay yeah. oh. mm -hmm. so 25 year marriage um that's a long time that's a yeah. mighty long time <laughs> so were you practicing prior to the divorce or was this something that transpired after and yeah how did that because i can imagine after being with a person for a quarter of a century, there was a lot that you had to unlearn, learn, and then relearn. <laughs> yeah. That sounded like a lot, but I, that's how I envisioned it. Like, <laughs> yeah. so like what was, and do you, I'm, 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 I'm going to assume that you do because you just seem like the kind you take what you learned in your own process of unpacking 25 years and also still trying to 
find that freedom, even in your sexuality, right? I'm sure that's a lot. Like, cause if you're, I don't want to be loose with these terms. So forgive me. But if you're used to getting it on the regular for 25 years, <laughs> and then <laughs> go to, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm being, I'm not trying to be crass, but it's like, that's an adjustment, man. So um, I guess I'm just wondering, like, were you practicing prior to, and if not, what was the like transition period like afterwards? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as a clinician, I've been practicing since 2000. That's when I opened up my practice. And then in my marriage, I had this business as a sex therapist. And when my marriage dissolved, right, the dissolution of my marriage really enabled me to become more embodied in the work that I do. So what I was doing before was practical and helpful, but it was very cerebral because I wasn't necessarily embodying the knowledge because of my, because of my relationship with my former husband. Mm -hmm. So there was a disconnect there. And now after my marriage is divorced, I am able to embody a lot of these truths in a very different way because yeah. now I understand them in my body. So in order for me to maintain my marriage, I needed to disconnect from my body. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. And that there was a lot of, a lot of trauma in my, in my former relationship. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure that whatever journey that you went on to get your healing, get your right side up, get your firm footing, your whole situation, your environment to return to a place of homostasis. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that those nuggets that you picked up along the way are some of the founding truths that your clients get to take advantage of because you were a forerunner, for lack of better terminology, uh, for people that experience anything similar to what you did. Um, so yeah, man. Um, I always find it interesting how um, I tell my friends all the time, like, God don't waste nothing, man. He don't waste nothing. He takes the good, the bad, the ugly, and he can use it for, you know, his good. Um, and in case, I, I'm sure, I don't care. I don't know you from Adam, <laughs> but I can, I can guarantee that ending a 25-year marriage was not a pleasant experience. So, but the fact that you're able to use even the, the ugly is, it's, it always, it does something to me. Yeah. Okay. So before I get sappy, uh, there was one part in particular that I wanted to kind of pick your brain about because you, one of your speaking topics is like uh, sex after cancer. And I immediately it like hit me like a ton of bricks because I have several friends who have uh, passed from it and who have survived but I never thought what their life I never thought considered how it could impact that area of their life so that's me and my own I guess selfish and kind of eternal uh view but man when I when I read it on your page I'm like because you're learning yourself again after a trauma I, that's the only way I can imagine like conquering cancer right that has to be some kind of I, and if trauma is the wrong word please correct me but that's I would consider it a trauma so how do you return back to that like how do you I never even considered it so yeah, take us through the process. Yes. Like I said, I have friends who who have battled and who have kicked cancer's butt. And I apologize to each and every one of you. You know, I love y'all. And I never considered, like I said, in my own selfish thinking, I never considered what the process would be like to even get to a point where I don't know if they're struggling with self-image or I don't feel sexy or I don't feel... Yeah worthy or I, I don't know um so yeah if you could like 
kind of and I and I know you probably you don't have time it will take you forever to like go through the but like give us like um kind of walk through like what that looks like and how you guide women and or men I'm assuming yes women and men in this area yeah yeah uh-huh, yeah yeah that's a great question Andrea and what I find is that because sex is a marginalized topic and we oftentimes don't have a vocabulary to speak about it fluently people don't ask and so medical providers who are caring for cancer patients may not have the comfort within themselves to speak about sex and sexuality, or they figure somebody else may be speaking about it, or they don't have the time, right? Because if they're only allotted so much time and you're thinking about life or death, then you're not necessarily thinking about pleasure and survival. So it, it, is, it is not necessarily a topic that people think of Unless what I see um, men who have testicular or um, prostate cancer, and then it is a, a question often of, am I going to have an erection afterwards? What's my functionality going to be after this treatment, after this cancer? Um, and so those, those types of cancers, often it comes to the forefront. And it really is a question for all people, I'd say, that have cancer because radiation, surgery, chemotherapy can all impact your sexual functioning and it can decrease and diminish your sense of sexuality and how vibrant you feel, how sexy you feel, and your ability to be sexual in the way that you were before. So if you have a double mastectomy, oftentimes that is an erogenous zone for women and then it's gone. And so neuroplasticity is one way to cultivate more or different erogenous zones in the body is, is that is a possibility. And so there are lots of things that we can do. And what I find is that oftentimes, and especially as people mature in their lives and in their relationships, is that sex is important and intimacy is, is way more important. And so they want to feel the emotional connection. And so people who have got, been on a cancer journey want to feel emotionally connected to the people that they love in their life, particularly their intimate partner. And so how do they do that? Well, one thing that I find is if a person has had cancer and their primary caregiver has been their significant other, their significant other may be concerned about touching them because they know if I touch them, they may feel pain and I don't want them to feel pain or it's difficult for them to be in their body or they've just gone through this treatment and we can't touch. And I mean, there's just so many variables. So what happens is generally I've seen is that there's this big chasm that increases and then neither of them know how to address it because the person with cancer may feel like they don't find me attractive. They're not approaching me. And then the person who's a caregiver feels like, I don't want to touch them because I don't want to hurt them. And they'll let me know if they're interested because when they're interested, I'll be there because I would like to be. And so it's just like, shoot. And so all these conversations are going on internally and nobody's again, creating that common language where they can begin to talk about what's important for them. And so what I find is it's not just limited to people who've been diagnosed with cancer. I'd say people who are in long-term partnerships, people who are in short-term partnerships, sometimes that chasm emerges and the sexual connection diminishes because I would say oftentimes we're domestic beings, like we like to have regularity and routine and a domestic life. And then we're erotic beings, like we like wildness, we like risk, risk. we like to have things that are adventurous because that um, sparks the kind of the neurochemical cocktail in our brain where endorph endorphins are released and we feel novelty and we feel different experiences and we can have that with our beloved in a long-term partnership but oftentimes we don't know how to cultivate that or create that because we don't have role models or because people aren't talking about sex or because we've never seen it before all we've seen is pornography and it's like that's misinformation sometimes and myths that are created from that and it's just one lens but when we can have maybe pornography and everything else like healthy sexuality and conversations that feel comfortable about sex and sexuality, then we begin to bridge this gap. So that's what I've seen with my work with the cancer patients is that it's adaptable to all people. So that's why I wrote this book, Rediscovering My Body, which was based on the work that I'd done with people with cancer and specifically women. And I could see where it was applied to all women because my 
greatest desire is for people to begin to identify what's true for them, what brings them pleasure and begin to be able to articulate it and say it confidently without shame and be able to really own it. Like that's what brings me pleasure. And can you give that to me? Because if you can't, that's okay. I can get it somewhere else, but it's really then about creating consent. But it begins with knowing what's true for us. Cause if we don't know what's true, then we're going to be reaching for things that just don't feel good. Mm. Mm. He said so much. And it's like, my brain was like, <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> so I guess one thing I'd ask, how does, and I love that you said for all women and that the work, some of the work that you did was based off of, you know, um, people surviving cancer or sex after a traumatic event. How do you, cause that chasm that you spoke of is real, right? So I guess, how do you, how would you um, advise people in a long-term relationship and or marriage that have that chasm, that great divide where one's thinking one thing, one thinking one thing, and, and neither of the narratives are on the same page. How do you, how would you advise them to kind of close the gap? Like what everyday tricks, if I could say that, without you charging me a fee for <laughs> sitting on your own like, <laughs> What advice, like what preliminary steps can people take to, for lack of better terminology, close the gap, man? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I find is that if we can be gentle with ourselves, like, and it's okay to be messy because when we really learn something, we make mistakes and it doesn't always come out perfectly. And to really give yourself permission to know that it's gonna be messy is really the first step. Okay. And then the second step is just to begin to ask for what it is that you want. Um, You know, I make all of these videos on YouTube and I would invite you to go check them out, but to really begin to ask of what is your true desire? And can you ask in a way that is free from manipulation or coercion and just really say like this is what I want can you know can we try this and then the other person when received like that it's like oh yeah why not we can try that sure and then the conversation begins but when we shame the other person or we berate them because of everything that happened in the past is that we're never going to get any traction to create something different so that's what I'd say. It's so really about being gentle with yourself, maybe laughing a little bit more. More time. It's humorous. It's fun. It's playful. It's creative. It's yeah. So bringing some laughter to it is great. Great medicine. I like that. And thank you for. I am a fan of making really difficult stuff easy. Yes. If, I feel like if you can cross whatever like bridge there is that takes me like you're a clinician you're very learned in this topic you can't use the same jargon as every day like <laughs> so taking something that's very intricate and meticulous and and seemingly difficult and making it simple enough for the the regular joe blow to like digest whoo y'all have my heart so thank you like just the the few tips that you said about like you know, just expressing it and giving yourself permission to be like, okay, this is going to get messy, but I promise if we can get through this together, we're going to be all right. (laughs) I love it. Yes. (laughs) So I love that. Um, Another thing we talked about trauma, and I know uh, one of the topics uh, we had discussed earlier was, um, well, not early on here, but earlier previously was trauma releasing exercises. Mm -hmm. Um, now, whatever trauma that would be, I don't even want to put a name on it. Trauma can be a plethora of different things, right? Yes. The way that it impacts different people. How, and like I said, without giving away your trade secrets, because I want you to get all <laughs> your coin, okay? But like, what is a trauma-releasing exercise? And can you give us maybe an example of one that would be, once again, something that we can apply to our everyday life if this is you and you have had a traumatic event 
and you're yeah. seeking uh, to reconnect with your partner or yourself. And yeah. You know, <laughs> yes. but engage in a trauma releasing exercise. What does that look like? I love it. Yes. So trauma releasing exercises are a specific protocol that were developed by Dr. David Berselli. And yeah, love Dr. David Berselli. He's a former Catholic missionary driver for Mother Teresa and just really a fun individual who was curious. And one of the things that he noticed is that when people were in life-threatening situations, natural disasters, war-torn countries, that they would shake. And mm -hmm. that shake really was a release of the nervous system. And so anytime we experience a trauma and trauma is anything that overwhelms the nervous system, we have the opportunity to shake. And so if you see a rabbit being chased by a fox and the rabbit lives another day, it will shake because it's releasing that neurochemical cocktail of adrenaline, of cortisol out of its body and kind of resets itself to its new homostasis, right? Okay, made it through that. I got to get back to normal so I can go out again. And we as humans are also animals and yet we don't do that. And so Dr. Berselli was like, well, we do experience traumas or microaggressions or things that impact our nervous system, but wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to be in a war-torn country or natural disaster to experience that shaking? So what can I devise to help people have that shaking experience? So he developed some exercises for everybody. And you know, he's traveled the world providing these for people. And I was in a couple of car accidents and really felt the impact of those and insomnia and anxiety of, of getting behind the wheel were two symptoms that I just couldn't shake. And it was debilitating. I thought this sucks because, oh, can I say that? <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> You're free here. <laughs> well, thank you. I said, this sucks and I want to be able to sleep. So my friend introduced the trauma releasing exercises and they're so powerful for me that I thought I got to provide this to my clients professionally. So even though trauma is not my primary issue that I work with, it's like everybody's been act, impacted by some type of trauma. And if they haven't personally, they know somebody who has, yes. right? So it's, it's pervasive. And so for me, I feel like this is kind of the public service. And what it is, it is shaking. It is the shaking, the physical tremors that happen in the body that need to be released that help clear the blockages and so that's what i can say about that and can you just shake yeah and i would say the more shaking that we do the more that we can um, have release in our body and is there a form to do it yeah you can check out dr Berselli's app it's like stress less teary if you want to know more about the form but it is something that is used in other trauma modalities like um stephen levine's or peter levine's work um sensory experiencing or uh, I can't think of it SC um but anyway there's, it's used in other trauma modalities I'm not trained in it but TRE or trauma releasing exercises uses the same theme of shaking so that's what I can say about that and it's highly effective it restores and resets the nervous system to I, I would say a new homeostasis that's not so aroused because when we have a, a trauma or traumatic experience, our nervous system is kind of up here and we think it's normal, right? And my shoulders are kind of like earrings mm -hmm. and it's like, okay. But when I bring them down and it's like a little bit back and I'm a little bit more relaxed, it's like my diaphragm is not so compressed and I can bring in more air into my body and I'm actually more relaxed. And it's like, oh, okay, now I can feel this feels different. But when I'm chronically like this, I think this is normal and it's not. And so the new normal is a much better experience. And I have more expansion within myself. And we don't know what we don't know. So we go to therapists, we go to clinicians, we go to coaches, we go to people so we can learn a little bit more. I have coaches, I have people who guide me on my path because I feel like we're not meant to do this alone, right? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not. No. Wow, wow. I love it. And I feel like, I, and once again, thank you for making it plain. Thank you for giving me something that I can like take and stick in my little pocket on my backpack or my purse or whatever, my fanny pack. Love it. it is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my next question, do you have any new projects coming down the pipeline? Like um, 
anything that you could talk about. Of course, if you can't, you know, I just left, I'm left being nosy, but since I am <laughs> naturally inquisitive, <laughs> do you have any pipe, uh, any projects or anything that you're working on coming down the pipeline? I do. Yes. So I have this YouTube channel that I've had for a number of years, and now I'm getting up to speed with more consistency. So I have these great new videos that I'm putting out. So I invite people to check those out. Um, it's kind of straightforward teaching about things like core values and how to talk about sex and sexual fantasies and oh my gosh. balance and, you know, kind of things All like that. All the stuff All that the people stuff. need. Oh yeah. my God. So I you, invite people to check that out. Do yeah, you um, deal with youth at all or is it more for adults i work primarily with adults i love youth but i'm not yeah that's not me like that's not me (laughs) (laughs) i remember you saying something about earlier where like training or whatever sex ed class like i don't know how old you're i'm not going to ask but i remember like robert the robert crown center was someplace it was in uh illinois and they take you and it was like like a mannequin, it was clear, and then the breast would light up. Boom, this <laughs> is the breast. Boom, this is the vagina. But it wasn't like this. <laughs> that was like the that was the 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 gist of like the entire sex ed training or whatever. Like there, there I don't remember anything else. So like it's it's not possible for people to expect that little humans yeah. would be able to properly traverse an unfamiliar territory not only unfamiliar but one where people have said no 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 all your life (laughs) it's it's like you we do people the little ones we do them in injustice not even the little ones the adults like I said because we yes (laughs) (laughs) we're doing ourselves in such an injustice but I'm I'm thankful for people like you who are willing to have the conversation willing to make stuff plain and willing to take some of the stuff that transpired way back when and make it connect to why we think or have certain theories or ideologies about stuff now and just release and just exhale doggone it oh yes exhale yes Uh uh-huh yes and I I am also running this month a special on my coaching packages so I invite people to sign up for my email list and then they can get a a discount on coaching pass packages this month so that's a great deal and then the other thing is that I'm hosting a class this is really I'm very excited about it it is the rediscovering my body class which is based on my book and it's a five-week class and I'll be offering it in the spring. So May, June. So May 31st, I believe, is the start date. All right. Y'all heard that. Look, mama, she got she got plans. She got stuff out here, resources that are readily available for consumption, dog on it. So I guess here's a perfect time. Tell my listeners where they can find you. I mean, use this time to to literally plug yourself, give us names, addresses, emails, social media outlets, YouTube, all the good stuff. Where can we find you? I love it. So my YouTube channel is Boulder Sex Therapy, which is the name of my business. And the other part of my business, which is a coaching business, is Rediscovering My Body, named after my book. And so Rediscovering My Body is my website. You can find me there. It's also my Facebook page. And you can also find me Tara Galliano. So those are the three. Boulder Sex Therapy, Rediscover My Body, and Tara Galliano. <laughs> right. Well, y'all heard it here. I won't say first because I'm sure she's like she's been featured all over. <laughs> but you heard it here where you can find her. She's everywhere you want to be. Miss Tara, thank you. Thank you Such so much. <laughs> yeah, really fun. Yeah, like I wish, I wish this was not something that obviously the majority of the world is doing because little ones keep appearing right i wish it was if 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 it's something that we do all the time like then why can't we talk about it like why why why? (laughs) and learn about it so we can do it in a healthy way in a healthy not just talking about body healthy but like mentally like so we can even think about it properly yes uh-huh. so well we can do. talk about it and we are so thank yes, ma'am. you for having yes, me ma'am. here love well, it thank you you're doing the lord's work honey you're doing it <laughs> <laughs> thank you i feel very pious <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, babies. Uh, My We Are Not So Different family, thank you for tuning in. 
Um, Y'all know the drill. Do find something to some kind of way to love on yourself this week. I want to hear about it. Find me in my DMs, find me in my emails and tell me all about how you chose to show yourself some love with some self-care this weekend. Until next week, I love y'all. Peace. We are not so different.